Empire. Welcome to Inside the Cap. I'm your host, Joel Corey. You can find me on Twitter at Corey Joel. That is C-O-R-R-Y. J-O-E-L. Also, you can find my regular CBSSports.com column, Agents Take on NFL Contracts and Salary Cap Matters. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at two things. The blockbuster trades, which have significantly altered the 2021 NFL Draft, and also what's going on with Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. First, we're going to look at the trades. Um, on Friday, uh, we had one blockbuster trade, which uh, dramatically changed the NFL uh, draft, the first round. The Miami Dolphins traded the number three pick to the San Francisco 49ers, who are at 12th. They swapped, and the Dolphins picked up a 22-23 and 23 first round pick and a 2022 third round compensatory pick for the Niners. Now, then... Shortly thereafter, the uh, Dolphins went ahead and traded, moved from 12 to 6 with the um, Philadelphia Eagles. And in that trade, um, they gave up that 22 first, the uh, the 2022 first round pick, their own, um, not the one they got from the Niners. So the Dolphins now have had a pretty significant haul. Just out of that Laramie Tunsil trade they made a couple of years ago. Tunsil's trade was essentially um, them picking up uh, two first-round picks, 2020 and 2021, and a second-round pick. <laughs> so uh, initially they turned that thing into four first-round picks <laughs> um, and a commensatory third. Then went ahead and traded one of those picks away to the uh, Eagles. So still, that's a pretty impressive haul <laughs> for Laramie Tunsil. Now, the question is, you get all these picks, and for any of these trades, can you capitalize on the picks? (laughs) That's that's what remains to be seen. Now, there's some implications to this whole trade. Um, First, the Niners don't move up to three unless they're going to take a quarterback. You don't give up that type of haul unless you're going to go get a quarterback. Now, at number two, the Jets sit there. Uh, Zach Wilson. Had a phenomenal pro day on Friday, the BYU quarterback. Some people speculated that maybe the Niners know what the Jets are going to do because of the tie with Robert Sala, the new head coach, was their defensive coordinator last year. They have an idea of what the Jets are going to do. So now conventional wisdom is the Jets are going to take Zach Wilson at number two, which is going to put Sam Darnold on the trading block. Uh, Darnold's under contract for 2021. $9,794,266. $9,794,266 is what his cap hit is. And then the million dollar question, or $18 million question, I should say, is what happens with the fifth year option that uh, the team, Jets, or somebody else would have to pick up by May 3rd um, and would be fully guaranteed <laughs> um, if you pick it up. So. The question is now, if the Jets are going to sit there and take quarterback number two, where do they deal um, Sam Darnold? That fifth-year option is scheduled to be $18.858 million fully guaranteed. So where would they deal him? Um, and what could they get for him? Wouldn't be a first-round pick. He's been up and down in the three years he's played. Uh, Josh Rosen, after his uh, lackluster rookie year, the Cardinals decided to take Kyler Murray, traded him. To the Dolphins, got a second and a fifth round pick. So is that going to be the proper compensation uh, for Sam Darnold to wherever he may go, uh, assuming they're taking a quarterback? Now, if they're comfortable with Darnold and they're going to exercise the option, they can auction off that second pick. And then the question is, if there is a specific quarterback the Niners want, would they move up um, one pick uh, to try to get to ensure that they get the quarterback they wanted. Um, we have seen that happen before in 2017. The Bears inexplicably moved from 3-2 to two to get Mitchell Trubisky when the no one's going to leapfrog them. 
from where they were at three. The Niners weren't taking a quarterback at two. Um, they gave up two-thirds in the fourth. So I don't know if that'd be the proper compensation. Should the 49ers want to do that? But I don't know if one of these teams, if like Carolina at number eight, who's clearly not happy with Teddy Bridgewater, or Denver at number nine, New England, 15, if they wanted to move up to two, if the Jets aren't going to take a quarterback, auction the pick off, then we kind of know what the haul is going to be um, to get there based on this trade going from uh, 12 to 3 for San Francisco. And the question is, let's assume the Jets are taking a quarterback. Then who are the 49ers looking at? Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. So it's going to be somebody who's going to be their quarterback. Then let's say quarterbacks go 1, 2, and 3. Then the draft really starts at the fourth pick. Now, the Falcons, interesting dilemma for them, just from the standpoint that they have an older quarterback in Matt Ryan. The fourth pick, would they take the guy that kind of falls in their lap <laughs> if they are going to take a quarterback and go one, two, three, four quarterback? Or do they are they comfortable with Matt Ryan because they restructured his contract again? I think this is the fourth restructure. So his 2022 cap number is now $48,662,500. The dead money, if you got rid of him in a conventional manner next year, uh, traded him before June 2nd would be $40.525 million. <laughs> so if they take a quarterback, that guy's going to redshirt for a year, maybe two, because you can't really get rid of Matt Ryan um, in 2020. He, he'd sit this year, and then it's impossible. Not impossible. Anything's possible. But that's tough. <laughs> $40.525 million in dead money. So you'd be sitting at quarterback for two years. So do they take the best, best player available at number four? Uh, they could help them, whatever that is, whether that's uh, what Kyle Pitts helping the secondary more than the wide receiver. So that'd be Patrick Sertan in the second. So that's an interesting one. So can someone move up to number four? They move back down, maybe eight, nine, or wherever, 15, and go from there. So then what happens to number five? The Bengals. If it goes quarterback one, two, three, or quarterback one, two, three, four, they're going to get a player they want. Um, help for Joe Burrow. Question is, what help would that be? Something on the outside? Um, skill position guy? Or would it be Panay Sewell play left tackle? You have that anchor the line. You got Riley Reef who signed after being cut from the Vikings as your um, right tackle. Or are you going to go one of the receivers? Uh, Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith. So then we get to the Eagles at number six. Apparently, they were trying to work a trade to get up to number three, but wanted to delay it because there's a specific guy they had in mind. Uh, we don't know who that, who that guy is. If he was available, then the trade would take place. That's something obviously the Dolphins didn't want to do, which is why the Niners now sit in that spot. Now they're sitting at number 12. So they're pretty much committed to Jalen Hurts for 2021 as to be their quarterback. If, it, if he doesn't work out and they find out through this evaluation trial period he's not the answer, they now have draft capital to be in position to go get a veteran in 2022 because they could have three first-round picks. If Carson Wentz has enough play time, I think it's 75%. It's either 70 or 75% his play time in 2021. That gives them another first-round pick. So they've got their own, potentially the Colts, and one from the Dolphins. Then Deshaun Watson right now holding pattern because of the issues – off the field issue, so maybe he doesn't get traded. If all that is resolved favorably by then, maybe he's the answer. Russell Wilson, um, he's back to being the old Russell Wilson where he's very supportive for anything that the Seahawks do in terms of a uh, move to better the team. So it seems like he's on board. And we'll see if, he, if he's still on the roster come draft time. Then... Um, Maybe he's a 22 option, 2022 option for the Eagles if things go wrong. Because we don't know who it is. Somebody's going to emerge in, for the 2022 draft class. We don't know who it is. And right now, maybe Sam Howell at UNC or Keaton Slovis, USC, would be the top two quarterbacks. Neither one of those two guys is as regarded as the guys in 2021 draft class were a year ago. So there's no Trevor Lawrence in this group. 
and we did see two guys emerge out of nowhere. Somebody's going to emerge. Where was Zach Wilson this time last year? Trying to get better to fight to win a starting competition because his job was put up for grabs. And this time last year, um, March 2020, April 2020, he looked at Alabama and you're like, hey, a great team. We don't know about the quarterback. Now we do know about the quarterback. He's going to be a first-round pick. The question is uh, where. Now, so that's the uh, one of the interesting parts of, of the, uh, the whole trade is how it impacts and shifts the draft. The teams that lose out of that, Carolina at 8 and Denver at 9, teams looking for quarterbacks. So now the only way they're going to probably get a quarterback potentially, if there's one they, they really like, is to move up. And that's where the Dolphins are, in, in, is, are interesting. They're sitting at number 6. Um, they're committed to Tua. So, um, a good player is going to drop to them. It's going to be Kyle Pitts, Jamar Chase. Um, Tua probably wants um, his old Alabama teammate, Devonta Smith. Now, one of these teams, that um, eight or nine, uh, Carolina or um, Denver, it'd be really interesting to see if they're willing to move up to six to try to get a quarterback. <laughs> And the Dolphins move back down and presumably get another first-round pick potentially for the move. <laughs> That'd be quite an interesting dynamic or scenario uh, that happened. But either way, the Dolphins are going to be in. A, we know they weren't comfortable at 12, but would they be comfortable moving down to like um, eight or nine or someplace in between from where they are six, 12 to acquire more picks to give them more assets, because then if um, Tua doesn't pan out, they could be in the same place um, Philadelphia is in next year and then making a run at a vet if possible. So I'm sure we haven't seen the last of draft day of movements for the NFL draft. Typically, these types of trades don't happen until we get close to the draft. We're about a month out from the draft, so we'll see what happens between now and then and what's going to shake up the draft order. Support for this podcast comes from Fordham University's Gabelli School of Business. For over 100 years, the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University has produced the values-driven leaders that modern business demands. The Gabelli School of Business offers full and part-time MBAs for those who learn as boldly as they live. From marketing and finance to analytics and accounting, you'll practice business with purpose. Taught by world-class professors in the heart of New York City or online from wherever you call home. Get started today at Fordham.edu slash MBA. What's up? It's Mike Jones from the Football Jones Podcast. I know you're enjoying your time with Inside the Cap, but once you're done, I want to invite you to come over and check out my podcast. Each week, we take a deep dive into some of the most pressing topics around the NFL. High-profile guests from the coach, player, and front office ranks, as well as the top league insiders. Check out the Football Jones Podcast, another fine product brought to you by Empire Media. Well, the 49ers moving up to number three makes Jimmy Garoppolo a lame duck quarterback. Um, Initially, uh, it came out San Francisco is positioning it that Jimmy Garoppolo will be the quarterback for 2021. We've heard that before. Um, When a team says that a player that seems like he should be on the trading block um, isn't. Rick Spielman saying that Percy Harvin's not going to be moved. What happens? <laughs> Percy Harvin got traded to Seattle shortly thereafter. So Jim Garoppolo has a no trade clause for 2021 only. Um, he's got a $26.4 million cap number this year. He's supposed to make $25.5 million this year. It's under contract for two years. Next year, he's supposed to make um, $25.6 million, so he is under contract for $51.1 million over two years. The way his uh, salary is broken down this year, and it's the way you see a lot of San Francisco contracts are. Um, he's got a $24.1 million base salary, $600,000 workout bonus, $800,000 in per game active roster bonuses. That's $50,000 per game, assuming a 16-game season. You know, it's, gonna, it's no more than 800 you can make. Um, for each game, he's on the uh, 48, 46, 48-man active roster. 
Um, so that's how his, he's, his contract's broken down this year. So um, if they move on from him, presumably through a trade, they could always release him. <laughs> um, then the dead money is only $2.8 million because he had a $7 million signing bonus in the deal he signed in 2018 for $27 million. $27.5 million per year, which briefly made him the highest-paid quarterback in the league. Uh, the Niners did something smart because they had a ton of cap room, which gave them maximum flexibility. They gave him a $28 million roster bonus, which wasn't prorated. So if they decide to part ways with him either way, cut or trade, they're picking up $23.6 million in cap space. Now, um, the 49ers... Lost in the Super Bowl um, 2019 season, decimated by injuries. In 2020, went 6-10. and 10. So, they think, if they think they can contend again, it would make sense to keep Garoppolo this year. Whatever quarterback they take, whether it's Trey Lance, Mac Jones, Justin Fields. Um, so, we're assuming Zach Wilson goes number two uh, to the Jets. And then, that person takes over in 2022. Now... If they are really looking to trade him, the most obvious place would be him going back to the team that drafted him, New England Patriots. Now, the Cam Newton contract does not preclude the Patriots from going out and getting another quarterback. Cap space is more the issue. Um, They have about $12 million of cap space, and that's the problem now, generally, that Garoppolo has $25.5 million in cash, so you, to make the trade, you'd have to absorb the full $25.5 million. There aren't a lot of teams who need a quarterback that have that type of cap room. Um, Denver has about $30.5 million. Carolina's got like twenty five point eight. So those are like the only two teams that could absorb his contract. So if you are going to trade him, it's probably going to be one of these Trent Brown restructure things where he's going to have to cut some salary, maybe put it back in incentives, maybe you lop off the 2022 year because he's doing something to his contract to accommodate a trade. Now, so saying the Cam Newton contract, base value of $5.1 million, max of 13.6 if he hits all the incentives, and they're tied to... His playtime, um, New England's playoff performance, what types of honors he earns. So he's not going to, he wouldn't make the whole 13 6 even if he uh, is their starter this year. Um, cap number of $5,506,250. So, yeah, that's the most logical place. Let's say that they're not going to first, and I'm sure that's a place that uh, Garoppolo would agree to have a trade to because he knows that system and that's where he got started. And what could you get for him? Maybe you get back the second-round pick that uh, you gave up to get him at best. Probably third or fourth-round pick, I would think. Last year, Nick Foles went for a conditional, uh, compensatory fourth-round pick, so it's going to be above that. <laughs> um, but probably no better than the uh, second-round pick when he was unproven, uh, strangely enough, that um, the 49ers gave the Patriots to get him. If he stays, I don't think he's going to be playing for the 25-5 because uh, that's just not what the market is. Because, one, he does have an ob- – outside New England, there's an obvious landing spot where he could start because all the musical qu- chairs for quarterbacks already filled up. So what would the 49ers probably do in a situation like that? Um, probably ask him to take a pay cut <laughs> um, to stay. Then it's up to Garoppolo. Does he think – that it's better for him to be the quarterback here or take his chances on the open market trying to find a starting job someplace. Now, we've seen what the market is um, for these quarterbacks who are the bridge quarterbacks, because that's what he is now if he stays. He's a bridge quarterback because he has no long-term future. We saw one bridge quarterback because Ben Roethlisberger's uh, last year's going to be 2021 unless something changes where he just looks like the Ben Roethlisberger in his prime, then they'd probably want him to stay. But he took a pay cut from $19 million down to $14 million. No way to make it up, make up the lost money. And we saw Andy Dalton go to the Bears, sign a one-year deal for $10.5 million, maxes out at thirteen five through incentives. And we saw Ryan Fitzpatrick go to the Washington football team, 
$10 million base value maxes out at 12. So if Garoppolo is going to take some sort of pay cut, which I expect the 49ers to come to him and want him to do to stay, <laughs> that is if he's going to be the quarterback for 2021, um, at least start the season. It'll probably be somewhere in that neighborhood, 10 to $14 million if he plays well and they get to the playoffs, because if they're thinking they're going to be a Super Bowl contending team, they're going to want to tie a significant portion of whatever money he lost if he could make it back to their team's success and his success as well. So that may be a way for him to be made whole. And he'd probably want to have that 2022 year lopped off, as we've seen when you take a pay cut. Um, sometimes you have that extra year lopped off so that uh, you can hit the market sooner rather than later. That would be one of the trade-offs for uh, doing something like that. Now, that could be all for not. Let's say he is the quarterback, and the veterans on the team probably don't want to go for a rookie quarterback to begin with to start the season because they're thinking, hey, I got a finite amount of time I can play football. (laughs) I don't want to waste a year. They'd welcome Garoppolo still being the quarterback. Um, thinking that they're a playoff-ready team. Now, if they get off to a bad start, and they're sitting there like, uh, I don't know, 1-4, and 2-5, and 3-6, and six, at some point, they're looking like they're not a playoff team. Then you'd make the switch. Or maybe if they get off to that poor of a start, New England's not doing well, or maybe Cam's not playing well and they're winning games in spite of him, then maybe you pull the trigger and you make a trade. You trade Garofalo midseason. So there's a lot to be said. Niner said he's going to be there for their quarterback for 2021. <laughs> a lot of people are skeptical about that. But um, if they're serious about thinking they're going to be a playoff team, then their quarterback can serve a one-year apprenticeship, kind of like um, Patrick Mahomes did for Alex Smith um, that first year. I know – Philadelphia had that intent when they drafted Carson Wentz. They said he wasn't going to play as a rookie, but they ended up uh, trading Sam Bradford in the preseason when Teddy Bridgewater um, had that gruesome, gruesome career threatening knee injury, and that plan went out the window. So we shall see what happens with uh, Jimmy Garoppolo. Does he stay or does he go? But the 49ers, in any event, they need to have a low-cost cost quarterback on a go-for basis just because of some of their big-ticket items. Um, They've got Trent Williams that they signed to a deal on its face, makes him the highest-paid offensive lineman in the NFL, $138.06 million for six years, but it's really a bifurcated deal because it's uh, three years and an option to pick up uh, the final three years. So worst-case scenario, it's $60.75 million over three years. But in any event, he's got the second-largest offensive line cap number in 2022 at 26.72 million you got eric eric armstead 20 million dollar cap hit this year 21.74 in 2022 george kittle highest paid tight end biggest cap number in 2021 and 2022 16.1 and 16.3 now they got some contracts coming down the pipe that they're going to need to have a cheap quarterback to accommodate uh, fred warner who's turned into if not the best off-the-ball linebacker, young guy, um, it's Darius Leonard. Now, the Colts want to get Leonard's deal done. Warner's now eligible for a uh, contract extension as well. They both have three years of service. If I'm Warner, I'm not in a hurry. I'm waiting to see what Leonard does and either try to leapfrog that or... I'm going to try to come in under that. And part of the reason I'm not in a hurry is the market's been stagnant the past couple of years. That C.J. Mosley go up to uh, $17 million per year in free agency when the Jets signed him. And then you had Bobby Wagner rightfully become the highest paid off-ball linebacker at $18 million per year two years ago, and it's still there. So if I'm Leonard, I'm trying to beat Bobby Wagner. If I'm Warner, if I can't get the deal I want, Maybe I play for my elevated base salary at my $3.384 million because he earned the uh, escalator for the second-round tender. And I know Robert Sala loves me in New York. Maybe I force them to tag me, or if they don't, because you really don't give off-ball linebackers franchise tags, I'm heading to New York. 
So knowing that, and the Niners probably, Niners probably know that as well, <laughs> maybe they got to pay him um, Bobby Wagner-type money. You've got Debo Samuel, who will be eligible for a new deal in 2022. He's their number one receiver. Um, so you're talking Kenny Galladay money at can come back, be healthy, and build upon that, build upon what he looked like as a rookie. Minimum Kenny Galladay money, $18 million per year, $40 million guarantees, $28 million um, fully guaranteed at signing when he's eligible for a deal next year in 2022. And the Niners are very proactive in terms of uh, signing core guys. Then you got the big one, Nick Bosa. Now, towards ACL, uh, was Defensive Rookie of the Year in 2019. So if Bosa comes back and he's Bosa, I anticipate T.J. Watt's going to move the needle and become the highest-paid defensive player in league history. Uh, right now, it is Bosa's brother, Joey, at $27 million per year. So is it going to be T.J. Watt at 28 29 to get to 30 But I anticipate Nick Bosa becomes the – if he comes back and he is what he – look like he's supposed to be and uh, plays like he did as a rookie or better off the ACL injury, that's a $30 million per year guy. <laughs> so you really need a cheap quarterback on a go for basis, whoever that guy may be. So um, we'll stay tuned on that and see what happens. But the Niners are setting themselves up to amass talent like you try to do when you have a low-cost quarterback. Um, since Jimmy Garoppolo is not the answer for them at quarterback. Microsoft Teams is helping a bicycle company reinvent the way that they work. We make bicycles for everyday riders. Once the pandemic hit, we started doing virtual visits. All of a sudden, we could open up our showroom to customers around the world. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash Teams. Support for this podcast comes from today's military. You have a calling. We have an answer. You want to have meaning in whatever you do. From improving your community to making the world a better place. You can find that fulfillment in today's military. You have a calling. We have an answer. Learn more at todaysmilitary.com. Hey there, it's John Kime of the John Kime Report podcast. I'm glad you're enjoying the Inside the Cap podcast with Joel Corey. When you're done, I invite you to listen to my podcast. Twice a week, my guests and I discuss the Washington football team, and the NFL. The show features numerous NFL insiders, former and current players and executives, and taps into the insight gained in my 25 plus years covering this franchise. Check out the John Kime Report, another fine product offered by Empire Media. Okay, finally, let's turn our attention to Aaron Rodgers. Packers have restructured practically every contract they can to create cap room except Aaron Rodgers, the league MVP. Curiously, the Packers paid a $6.8 million let it vest roster bonus that Rodgers had um, for being on the roster the third day of the league year, um, which was March 19th, instead of converting that into signing bonus. Had they converted that into signing bonus, they could have created four million five hundred thirty three thousand three hundred thirty four dollars a cap room instead they decided not to do that um it came out last week there are reports they're trying to do something else to rogers contract rework it uh where it wouldn't just be a simple restructure i don't know if that's an extension or what the deal is because if they just wanted to do a simple restructure they don't need his permission because paragraph nine of the addendum of this contract gives the team the right to convert salary. And um, I'll sum up what this clause says. That um, on one more occasions during the duration of the contract, club in its sole discretion has the right, not the obligation, to convert any portion of players' salaries, whether paragraph 5, roster bonuses, or whatever, into signing bonus. And the two parties agree that an email or phone call to from the team to the player or his agent will trigger those rights so whatever amount they decide to convert then he's got to execute a new contract within three business days of getting the contract otherwise he's considered in breach of contract and the thing is it also says that the payment 
for uh, whatever money is converted stays on the original terms of how it was supposed to be paid. So if it was all base salary, you get paid like it was base salary. You don't get like the signing bonus and you get paid in a lump sum early. Um, so that's paragraph nine of the addendum. So don't even commit permission just to do a simple restructure. So that means Packers wanted to take his base salary of fourteen point seven million and he's got a one million seventy five thousand dollar minimum base salary. He's got he's under contract through twenty twenty three. They wanted to convert that. They could get basically a little over nine million dollars of cap relief this year. So let's say that they didn't they just did it so they would get four or five. Nine million total, so it's four or five. They'd be raising his cap number in 2022 and 2023 by 4.5 million. The way it stands right now, since they took Jordan Love in the first round, trade up to get him last year, which uh, Robert Rogers rightfully wasn't happy about, set off the speculation that Rogers won't be there long term. That one of the reasons you don't touch his contract is right now he's got a 39.852 million dollar cap number in 2022, and if you don't do anything. Then there's 17.204 million in dead money. So if you trade them, you pick up 22.648 million dollars of cap space. Now, if you went ahead and did the conversion I was just talking about, then if you traded Rogers next year, you're going to add nine million to the dead money. So the dead money becomes 26.204, and then the cap relief that you would gain would be $13.648 million. <laughs> so Rodgers wants some assurances at a minimum that he's going to be around <laughs> beyond 2021, and he's not basically doing a league-wide audition to get traded someplace next year. Now, his contract lines up perfectly with Jordan Love's that they're both up after the 2023 season. You don't typically draft a quarterback in the first round trade up not to have him play. Rodgers sat behind Brett Favre, so he's seen this from both ends. <laughs> Being the new guy that comes in, and now he's in Favre's position, so <laughs> he wants clarity, and I don't blame him. And the Packers, if Love is their guy, and some of this will depend on what happens this year, that you got to pick up the fifth-year option heading into the fourth year. So he will have sat two years, you would need him to play 2022 to know whether you could pick up the fifth-year option. Plus, he's dirt cheap. <laughs> he's got salaries in 2022 of $1,735,770. That's a cap number of $3,777,310. Then in 2023, just under two three as a salary, and the cap number is basically 3.94. So, <laughs> we're talking apples and oranges in terms of uh, what are you talking about? As it stands right now, Rogers' 2021 20, cap number, 37.202 million, is the highest cap number in the league. The one in 2022 of 39.852 is number four in the league. So typically you don't give a guy an extension when he's got three years left on his contract. So if the Packers are trying to preserve flexibility, I don't know if this would placate Rogers, but do you guarantee salary in the future? That doesn't prevent them from trading him. Maybe it's cosmetic, makes him feel good about things <laughs> to a degree. Or is he in a revengeful mode where he's like, you know what? <laughs> the only thing I'm willing to do, <laughs> if you want to do your simple restructure and make it harder to trade me, <laughs> hurt you cap-wise, and not, you can do that. <laughs> but the only thing I want is a real restructure because he's got a base salary of $25 million in 2022. And in $25 million in 2023, $500,000 workout bonuses. So, so you guaranteed those two years. He's, he's a steal if you trade him, and he's making twenty five five in 2022 and 2023 each year. So you're talking $51 million over two years. He's a steal at that. When he signed the deal, he became the highest paid player in league history at $33.5 million per year. Now you got Patrick Mahomes at $45 million. You have... Um, Dak Prescott at 40, Deshaun Watson at 39. If Josh Allen and um, and or Lamar Jackson get done, 
they're going in that Watson Prescott neighborhood. So yeah, he probably feels like, hey, I may be 38 towards the end of the season in December. I said I was going to play well into my 40s. I'm coming off arguably the best year of my career. <laughs> he threw for 48 touchdown passes, led the league career high, career high po- completion percentage, 70.7%, had the best passer rating in the league, 121.5, actually the second best in league history um, passer rating. He has the top one, uh, 122.5 in 2011. So, like, hey, I'm in my prime. This is Aaron Rodgers would be thinking. So, for him, maybe if anything's going to be done, he wants a real extension. <laughs> so, as I said, you typically don't do extensions with guys who have three years left on a, on a contract. But we did see one last year when DeAndre Hopkins um, got traded uh, from Houston to Arizona. He had $39.915 million left on his contract. And he got a two-year extension uh, right before the start of the regular season, which averaged um, $54.5 million is the new money. So extension average is $27.25 million per year. Makes him the highest paid non-quarterback in the league. So if I'm Rodgers and I'm his people, I'm like, hey, extend the contract two years. He's got three. <laughs> Rework it in the way uh, kind of like uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Granted, there's one big difference that there's no bonus proration when you trade someone because the bonus proration stays with the other team. So that makes it much easier to work in extension. Because you don't have the constraints of having the uh, cap charges from a signing bonus. And then because I already restructured Rodgers' contract once, the additional signing bonus uh, proration. Because um, at the end of 2019 season, they turned $14.26 million into a uh, signing bonus. So that just complicates matters from a proration standpoint. So if you're going to try to do something. And Rodgers hasn't been one who's been willing to take a discount. Most players don't take a discount until late in their career, unless you're Tom Brady, who the only time he was the highest paid player in the league was the 2018 deal, 2010 deal, I should say, which averaged $18 million per year. Other than that, Brady hasn't been one to look for top dollar. Um, Rodgers, um, the 2013 extension at $22 million per year made him the highest paid player in the league. The 2000 18 extension at $33.5 million per year, maybe the highest paid player in the league. So I'd suspect Aaron Rodgers ain't thinking, particularly after they drafted Jordan Love, I'm not helping you out. If we're going to do a real deal, real extension, where you're committing to me, and we're making Jordan Love a tradable asset, maybe not this year, maybe hold on to him this year. If you do an extension for Rodgers and you trade him in 2022, there is no obvious guy in the draft, so... He probably have more value, at least it appears, next year than this year. Maybe you get the second-round pick that um, the 49ers gave to New England for Garoppolo, who, similar kind of circumstances, drafted their parent. Tom Brady was like, not so fast, played great football. I can't see Aaron Rodgers taking one for the team. Drew Brees didn't do it until the 2018 deal <laughs> when he's pushing 40. <laughs> the 2016 a negotiation dragged on where they couldn't use cap room and got that thing done as the regular season was approaching. <laughs> I really don't see Aaron Rodgers being one of these, hey, you know what, I've made my money. <laughs> so what would this thing kind of look like? Well, let's look at the Hopkins thing. Hopkins was scheduled to make 12-5 in 2020, ends up making 29. Um, so $16.5 million in new money. So 30% of his new money basically – came this year 2021 through 2021 he's got 42.75 million in cash he's supposed to make 13.5 in 2021 that's 16.75 million in new money so it's basically 31 percent through the existing years of the contract DeAndre Hopkins 20.135 million that's 37 percent of the new money then this thing takes a bigger jump the in terms of the new money he's at 39.585 million through the first new year. And he's got a way to void out of the deal. With, 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 you wouldn't be giving that to um, Rodgers. But Hopkins can void out through outstanding performance. So he's got basically 73% of his new money through the first year. And then the salary drops big time. Then 
It's obviously 54.5, he played out the contract, didn't void it. So, kind of using that as a template for or a blueprint. It's the only way this would really work, and it wouldn't be attractive to the Packers, I would think. You got to give him a big signing bonus. <laughs> he had the biggest signing bonus in NFL history um, when he signed at $57.5 million. And this is a team which doesn't defer money. <laughs> so he got all that money in year one. So we've already given him the 6-8 because you didn't convert it. This would just be a tough thing to swallow. You got to go huge signing bonus, kind of like you did the last time. <laughs> and he's probably going to be like, you know what, extended two years. That's for years 2024, 2025. The cap's going to go way up because of new TV money. Mahomes is $45 million per year, highest paid guy right now. Maybe 47 and a half is the new money in those two years. Obviously, you don't do this like an NBA contract. You tack it on at the end. He's not like the Giannis Antetokounmpo, so it's not going to kick in then. So you'd have to give him a big signing bonus. So what is it, 55, 57 and a half, 60 million, and you drop his base salary down to a million? And then the thing is, how much cap relief could you get out of this thing? And how do you keep the second-year cap number close to where it is now? It's $39.852 million. So you'd have to drop his base down to minimum for this to even work. And let's say, I'm just using this as an example just to illustrate the point. Say you got a $60 million signing bonus. You drop the base down to uh, $1.075 million as league minimum. His cast this year would be $67.875 million. Then your cap number, you get a little bit of cap relief. You can almost see you're buying out the incentives because he's got a million dollars worth of incentives in each year um, in the contract. You're buying those out. So they're gone. You know, right now you got eight fifty of incentives counting on the cap is likely to be earned. You buy them out. So they're gone through this whole thing. So the cap number would go from 37202. You get a little bit of cap relief to 34.227. Cap number next year is 39.852. Um, if you pick up a little bit of cap relief, not much. Drop the base down to like 13.125 or 13, something like that, where he's got 81 million of cash through two years. And then the cap number is 39.477. So he's got. Thirty-three and a half million in new money through the two years, and then let's say twenty-nine million is a base in twenty twenty-three. That cap number be kind of high. Uh, that's where the cap's going to be big increase over what it currently is. It's currently twenty-eight point three five two million. And then you're you're basically going up fifteen, basically fifteen and a half from what it was going to be, uh, forty-three point eight five two. So he's made 110 over the three years. You guarantee all of that at signing. So what he was supposed to, the years he was supposed to be under contract, still guarantee, uh, guarantee. So you play year he plays where he's 38 late in the year, 39, then 40. That's 110 over three, fully guaranteed at signing. I wouldn't want to guarantee anything beyond that from the Packers. He's going to want something guaranteed in year four. Dak Prescott has 126 million total guarantees. So if we're going on this front-loaded, player-friendly cash flow thing with DeAndre Hopkins, you'd have to have, have make like 140 in cash to 145 in cash through uh, 2024. So let's say it's $32 million as a base or whatever salary in 2024, then it's 142 in cash through those four years. That's 69 in new money at that point. And since you have $12 million prorated on the signing bonus throughout this deal, then that's a cap number 44 in 2024, which would be manageable because the cap should explode by then. And then the last year, it goes down to, we'll say, like 26. So that's $168 million in cash over the five years. Rodgers currently is scheduled to make $73 million. Um, over the next three years. So we're talking 95 in new money over two years, 47.5 million. And Kapner would be 38 million in 2025. So then he's, that would be the year when he's 42. You'd have to be comfortable that he's not going to fall off a cliff. And he's going to be more like Tom Brady 
you saw Drew Brees they could work around. The, the arm strength wasn't there, but still, very good quarterback. He's going to be one of those guys. If not, then you don't do anything if he wants a real extension. And you just keep it as is. Maybe you do, hopefully he'll agree to just guaranteeing money. No no increase. Maybe you do nothing. Or then maybe you just do the simple restructure. He probably wouldn't be happy with that. Just a simple restructure. Because at the end of the regular season, he, he made it clear he, he was not happy with things. Wants clarity about his future. But we'll see where this thing goes. If they can work something out. It took forever to get the extension done in 2018. So, if I'm the Packers, I would lean towards trying to get something done with Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> and Jordan Love becomes a wasted pick and a tradable asset that hopefully we can get something decent for in 2022 and go from there. But um, we'll see what happens with uh, Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. Well, that's going to be it for this week's Inside the Cap. Uh, thank you guys for, for listening. Don't forget... Uh, you can find me at Corey Joel, that is C-O-R-R-Y J-O-E-L on Twitter. And also I have my regular CBS Sports.com column, Agents Tape. Um, we'll see you back here next time.